We're delighted again to have Ambassador Crocker with us. Good afternoon. It's an honor to, uh, to introduce our guest speaker today, Ambassador Ryan Crocker. Today he's going to share with us his perspective on U.S. foreign policy and the ongoing conflicts in the Middle East. He's going to draw upon his six, uh, six tours as ambassador to some very simple uh, nations in the Middle East and offer his insight on the current administration's approach to the region. But before I go further in the introduction, where are my Marines in the room? Yeah, they are. It makes me feel good. Thanks for your service. Thanks for breaking away from Marine Week where you get to show off your tow missiles and fly helicopters and break stuff. Don't go anywhere because I'm going to need you a little later. So my name is Dave Calloway. I'm an emergency medicine physician at Atrium Health where I run our disaster medicine program. I'm also the chief medical officer for Team Rubicon. Some of you may wonder why an ER doctor is standing up here about to introduce a, a career diplomat. And the basic short story is I begged uh, LJ to let me do it for about a year. Um, and he was kind enough to, to let me come up here, so hopefully I won't screw it up. The longer answer is that Ambassador Crocker and my sphere in life have crossed a few times. The first was when I was a young physician in Iraq in 2003, then later uh, as members of the uh, Council on Foreign Relations, and then most recently with his role with Mercy Corps, an international uh, relief uh, organization. He also is a recipient of the Foreign Service Rivkin Award for Creative Dissent, which quite honestly makes him my hero. So if you can get an award for creative dissent, you've made it in life. Ambassador Crocker is currently diplomat in residence at the Woodrow Wilson School of Princeton and on sabbatical from the George Bush School of Government and Public Service. Diplomat in residence, for those of you who are wondering, is the type of amazing title you get after four decades of foreign service with dozens of awards for diplomacy, gallantry, and irrepressible commitment to your community and to humanity. The depth of Ambassador Crocker's experience in the Middle East is unrivaled. I'll just go through the, the tweets here, the 140 character highlights. He was assigned to the American Embassy in Beirut during the bombings of the Embassy of the Marine Barracks in 1983. From 98 to 2001, he was ambassador to Syria during the transition from father to son uh, in the Assad regime. In 2002, he was sent to Afghanistan to reopen the US Embassy in Kabul. In May through August of 2003, he was the first director of the governance for the, the Coalition Provisional Authority, the ruling body in, in Iraq. And then after a brief stint as ambassador to Pakistan for a little rest and relaxation, he came back as ambassador to Iraq from 2007 to 2009 during a period of major conflicts and, and major U.S. policy changes. So after 40 years of, of public service, Ambassador Crocker retired in 2009 and was honored with the Presidential Medal of Freedom. And the problem with being a singular expert is that your government doesn't ever want to let you go. And so in the midst of U.S. re-engagement in, in Afghanistan, President Obama coaxed him to come back into public service and serve as ambassador to Afghanistan in 2011. These are just the highlights. Ambassador Ryan Crocker is one of the individuals who's lived and written the nuanced history between the headlines. And amongst his other awards, which I'm not going to go into great detail because they're in the bio, he's a recipient of the Wild Bill Donovan Award. So Google it. It's from Bill Donovan, the founder of the OSS in World War II and not something that's given out lightly. This is the type of individual that Ambassador Crocker is. So it's amazing that 100 years after the Arab revolt that sparked much of the modern complexity in the Middle East and brought us T.E. Lawrence uh, fame, we're able to spend time with a man that President Bush called America's Lawrence of Arabia. And to boot, he's one of 75 individuals who was awarded the title of Honorary Marine. So ladies, gentlemen, Marines, Let's please welcome Ambassador Crocker to the stage. Well, thank you, David, for that very generous introduction. I'm afraid it's all downhill from here. Um, I could be introduced uh, a lot of ways. I like the way uh, David did it, of course. Uh, another way to do it would be to um, imagine a photograph of every significant foreign policy or national security setback for the United States in the greater Middle East. You know, uh, you can start in 1979, that was a bad year, uh, Iran hostages, Soviet invasion of Afghanistan and so forth. So if you could imagine that, I would be in every single one of those pictures. First row, third from the left. Uh, uh, as, as David noted, I, I was an ambassador six times I'd make a couple of comments on that because I think they, they revealed to me at least what the American Foreign Service is, is all about. I, 
I was an ambassador three times for Republican administrations and three times for Democratic administrations. Uh, your, your foreign service, like your military services, is apolitical. Uh, nobody elects us. Uh, we are appointed and then confirmed uh, by people who were elected. The White House for the appointment, the Senate for confirmation. We never lose sight of that. We advise on policy. Uh, we do not make policy. Uh, and when policy is made, our job is implementation. Uh, I think as we go through some of the turbulent times here, it's important to keep that, uh, that in focus. Uh, the second point I'd make about those six ambassadorships, in three of those countries, in, in Lebanon, in Afghanistan, uh, and in Pakistan, a, a predecessor of mine as American ambassador was assassinated at post. Uh, the, the Foreign Service, particularly in these times, is an inherently dangerous profession if you're doing it right. Uh, you are out there on point uh, in very complex situations trying to figure out ways forward that might not necessitate sending in the Marines. Uh, so if we're doing this right, we're going to be in crunchy places and some of us are going to go down. That's a fact of life. Uh, when you make a literally federal case out of it, as was done with my colleague Chris Stevens in Benghazi, uh, you are damaging our ability uh, to, to go forward and, uh, and take some risks that are necessary for our national security. Um, let me just say a word about being here in Charlotte. Uh, it's my second, second time to speak here. Uh, I, I'm a huge supporter of the World Affairs Council's nationwide. Uh, I'll come back to that in a second. Uh, the Charlotte Council is one of our strongest. Uh, uh, and it speaks well, of course, of the current leadership, LJ and, and your board. Uh, it speaks well of this community. Uh, clearly, this is a place that understands that what happens in the world affects what happens here at home and vice versa. So I I applaud all of you for your support for this council. Uh, if um, any of you are not currently members, I'm quite certain that LJ and his team can sign you up. Uh, it's actually the only way you're going to get out of this room. So, uh. <laughs> um. uh, these are these are very difficult times for us, and that underscores the importance of these councils. Uh, when I was in Beirut on my first tour in the early 1980s, uh, every major media outlet had a Beirut bureau. Uh, uh, all of the national outlets, of course, but also regional papers. Uh, Miami Herald was there, Philadelphia Inquirer was there, uh, several others. Uh, that's gone. The, uh, the core of Foreign correspondence is maybe a tenth of the size now that it was then, at a time when the world has never been more complicated. Uh, uh, so I don't see that trend line changing, unfortunately. Uh, we'll probably be lucky if they can hold it where it is. But that means a much greater weight falls on councils such as this in terms of making available uh, perspectives on the broader world to communities. Uh, I'm happy to say that as the foreign correspondent line has gone down, the World Affairs Council line has gone up, and I, I would just say that that's, that's, that's critical to um, uh, our, our own national security. Um, uh, delighted to see the Marines here. I I'm very proud of being an honorary Marine. I quite understand that is not the same as standing in those yellow footprints. Uh, uh, it'll take years of expensive counseling to forget that. Um, uh, the Marine, Marine Corps and the Foreign Service have a unique relationship. Uh, uh, Marines have guarded our embassies since uh, the 1940s, after World War II. When I started my career in the early 70s, uh, the, the Marine security attachments then were um, uh, largely ceremonial units. 
Well, that's evolved, as they say. Uh, they are now small infantry units. Uh, you know, the last best line of defense for an embassy under attack. <clears throat> and I have uh, seen, that, uh, seen that go down in, uh, in Lebanon and in Syria, where uh, a well-trained Marine Guard detachment of seven Marines uh, uh, stood off a crowd of hundreds and hundreds of rioters. Uh, so again, delighted to see uh, all of you here. Uh, one of the Marines here with us, uh, Sergeant Raber, Sergeant, could you stand? Uh, was a uh, Marine security guard in uh, some crunchy places uh, like uh, Addis Ababa uh, when things went south in a hurry and we got blamed. Uh, so uh, just delighted to see you here, Sergeant, and I am sure you're um, uh, giving the uh, younger Marines present uh, a good line on why the Marine Security Guard this program is a good assignment. It is. Thank you. <laughs> so, um, the Middle East and the U.S. I, I'll give you fair warning now. I, uh, I'm not an academic by training. I have found academic disciplines to be important to me, none more important than history. Uh, we Americans are not great at history. Uh, that's history is pejorative in our usage. Uh, other societies pay a lot of attention to it. And if you don't know what happened the day before yesterday, somebody will teach you and you're probably not going to enjoy the lesson. Uh, certainly not in the, uh, in the Middle East. So part of this is a, a history review. We're kind of at the 100th year anniversary uh, stage since World War I. Uh, you know, looking back on that uh, horrific conflict and how it shaped the modern Middle East, because it did. Uh, World War I, as you might recall, had among its protagonists the, um, the Ottoman Empire, uh, which held sway throughout the modern Middle East. Uh, so one of the big questions in the Versailles talks was, uh, so now what for this, for this region that the Ottoman Empire was no longer there? Uh, well, the British and the French had already figured this out. Um, 1916, the Sykes-Picot Agreement. Uh, Mr. Sykes, British, Monsieur Picot, French. Uh, it was a secret agreement, not publicized when it was signed, and it basically divided the Arab lands of the Ottoman Empire between the French and the British. Um, so that part of Versailles was kind of done in advance and under the table. Uh, Woodrow Wilson, of course, was at Versailles. He had different ideas enshrined in his 14 points. Uh, uh, he authorized something called the King Crane Commission to go out to the region and to do the unthinkable, to actually ask the people of the region what form of government they would like to see in the wake of the Ottoman Empire. Uh, uh, they all ritually said independence, uh, most of them knew that was not on the cards, at least immediately. So their second choice was uh, uh, a unitary mandate for the entire region supervised by the United States. Uh, uh, Britain was a distant third, and the French did not move the meter. Um, that, of course, is not how it played out. Uh, uh, Wilson was already ill. The 1918 elections produced an isolationist Congress that refused to ratify the League of Nations Treaty, keeping us out. And what was the consequence? Well, you basically saw a two-decade truce between two halves of one horrific world war, because that's all it was, 1919 to 1939. 1945, the war is over, and the world changes. Uh, the improbable Harry Truman uh, wound up doing what um, 
Wilson would have liked to do, I think, and what Franklin Roosevelt prepared for him to do. The U.S., unlike the aftermath of World War I, the U.S. would lead in a new world order. Uh, that order was largely conceived in the United States. The San Francisco Conference led to the founding of the United Nations. The Bretton Woods Agreement established the post-war international financial system. Um, NATO, again, uh, a U.S. initiative. Not only did we do the intellectual conception, if you will, we were prepared to lead. Not to dominate, not to dictate, but to lead. Uh, and that became an article of faith for successive American administrations, uh, both uh, Republican and Democrat. Uh, did that make the world a perfect place? Far from it. Uh, uh, explosions here, small wars there, Vietnam would be a case study, uh, but no global conflict. Um, politically, that was also the alliance of the free world that eventually brought down the Soviet Union. Uh, the war of ideas as well as kinetic means. That changed, not with the election of Donald Trump, it changed with the election of Barack Obama. Uh, if uh, any of you have read the uh, Atlantic piece of a couple of years ago now called The Obama Doctrine, uh, if you've read it, I, I think I see some heads nodding. If you haven't read it, go, go, uh, go look it up. It's, it's very much worth reflecting on. Uh, President Obama basically asked the question. It's been a long time since World War II. Uh, a lot of U.S. leadership for good and not so good. Uh, he knew that he was elected to end wars. Uh, an American public sick and tired of Iraq and even of Afghanistan. Uh, so he kind of had a popular mandate there. He, he talked about so-called allies like Saudi Arabia and Egypt. Uh, he talked about free riders in NATO. Uh, uh, much is made of the extraordinary differences between the Barack Obama and Donald Trump administrations. There are also some points of real similarity. This would be one of them. Uh, even the language. Uh, free riders. Uh, it's a legitimate question to ask. Uh, you don't go on forever doing the same thing over and over without kind of challenging your own ideas and conceptions. Uh, but what we, we saw really by the end of the Obama presidency, if you look again at the Middle East, um, our traditional allies and understandings in that region were at a low ebb. Uh, uh, we were having significant difficulties in our relationships with Egypt, with Saudi Arabia, with Israel, with Jordan. Uh, with Turkey. Turkey is not a Middle Eastern country, but as I noted, they used to own it. Um, uh, and and uh, President Trump, I think, saw an opportunity there. His first trip abroad was to the Middle East, uh, uh, which was deeply appreciated by the peoples of those countries. But there was no follow-up. Um, what the Trump administration, in my view, lacked then and still lacks they don't have the infrastructure uh, for policy implementation. Uh, the, the Tillerson year plus were, were horrible for the State Department. Uh, we, didn't have, we still don't have ambassadors in any number of key countries. We don't have confirmed assistant secretaries in, uh, in Washington. So it's been, a, um, it's been and will be a long slog. Now, why do I belabor you with this? Uh, we need to kind of look out there and try and imagine what the, the world is going to look like if the U.S. really does stick to the position, these are your problems, you sort them out, we got stuff to do back home. Um, I would give you one example. So I, as David noted, I'm on the Board of Mercy Corps, so I, I think about these things. Uh, the refugee and immigrant crisis. Uh, styled as or described as the greatest refugee crisis since the end of World War II. 
Well, we, at the end of World War II, we, we led there as we led everywhere. Our uh, deployed troops in Europe had that as a mission. Um, figure out where they're coming from, what routes they take, go out, police them up, uh, get them somewhere warm and safe, <clears throat> and then we'll move them on. Um, we manifestly did not do that uh, this time around. And again, consistency between administrations, but the decision not to be engaged on the refugee crisis came in the Obama administration. Um, it was a Middle East problem, it was an Africa problem, it was a European problem, but it was not an American problem. Um, so however you slice it, it became a pretty, pretty ugly episode, and it still is. Uh, thousands die trying to cross the Mediterranean. Now more migrants and refugees. Earlier it was the refugees trying to go east to west. Now it's south to north. Um, you know, we know what those shipping routes are. We've had the Sixth Fleet in the Mediterranean for over 70 years. We, you know, we know every current, every shoal, every reef, every shipping lane. Uh, you don't hear about Sixth Fleet ships rescuing migrants or refugees from a foundering boat. They, they're sure to be out of sight, because common law of the sea requires any vessel that can render assistance to a vessel in trouble must do so, so you just stay over the horizon. And there are reasons for that. Uh, what do you do with the men if you've got them? I, I get that. But we've never had a national debate uh, in this country on what should the U.S. be doing in this area, not purely as a humanitarian issue, but as a national security issue. We haven't had that conversation, but we have dramatically shifted our attitude toward refugees and immigrants, starting again with, uh, with President Obama. Uh, so why do, I, why do I, again, belabor you with this? Um, I don't think I see an alternative to US leadership in this world. And the world is not in a condition to run by itself, to put it mildly. Um, my fear is not that the Chinese are going to be our, our successors uh, as the leaders of a new world order. Instead, it's the fear that the Chinese can't do it. Uh, we do, in my view, continue to be that one indispensable nation. Uh, so if we back away, we are not likely to see a country or countries step in to assume our role uh, in doing what we can to keep the peace uh, around the world, not always by our own elements, but, but uh, in alliance with others. I just don't see it out there. Um, now, a lot of cases have been made why our traditional alliances are important. Um, in the Middle East, you know, I, I wish we had the choice that some in the Obama administration had posited, the choice between democracies and autocracies. Well, we don't have that choice. Uh, uh, the only fully developed democracy in the region is Israel. Uh, and they are moving into some challenging times as well. Uh, so for me, it's the choice between the forces of order and the forces of disorder. Uh, uh, the forces of order, uh, again, Israel, Jordan, Saudi Arabia, uh, uh, certainly Turkey, lots of problems, Egypt, uh, lots of problems there with those countries and the way they behave regionally and domestically. Uh, if we're going to change those problems, we're first going to have to reestablish a relationship of some trust and confidence. Uh, we will get nowhere delivering them high-minded lectures uh, without their knowledge that they can count on us in a crunch, which they did not have, have not had, uh, really from 2009 up until today. Uh, take Europe, too. Uh, there are, vo are many American voices out there re-emphasizing the importance of, of NATO going forward, and NATO is a vibrant organization. Uh, uh, about a third of the combat troops in Afghanistan are not American. They are from the NATO allies. Uh, 
who 17 years into this are fully committed to that mission. As long as we're there, they'll be there. Um, I, I will give you an even darker scenario here. Some horrible things have come out of Europe. Uh, in, in the last century, we got World War I, we got World War II, we got the Soviet version of international communism. How many millions did Stalin kill of his own people in the name of that ideology? We got the Holocaust. That's all been within the last century and it all happened or started in Europe. So do we really think that's the distant past and it can never, ever, ever again recur because, because why exactly? As we look at those wide-scale far-right demonstrations in Germany, as we look at Hungary uh, with its prime minister, sidebar there, I'm uh, a governor on the Broadcasting Board of Governors. Uh, we oversee uh, U.S. international media like Voice of America, Radio Free Europe, Radio Liberty. Uh, we have reestablished our Hungarian language service. Hungary is a member of NATO. Uh, so, so we're looking at currents and tides out there uh, that should be deeply disturbing to us. Uh, uh, can it never happen again? Because why? I, I, I come up a little short on the why. Uh, uh, so I would be worried as an American, frankly. Uh, what happens in Europe doesn't stay in Europe necessarily. And again, the track record is is pretty scary. Just like what happens in the Middle East doesn't stay in the Middle East. Uh, it has a way of getting your attention. We all like the idea, I think, of the pivot to Asia. If you look at that anthropomorphically, you've turned your backside to the Middle East, which is gonna take a substantial bite out of it, um, as President Obama encountered in um, places like Iraq and, uh, and Afghanistan. So what do we do going forward? First, I hope we will have a national debate on these things. Uh, uh, do we stay or do we go? If we go, what are the likely consequences? What could happen if we are not there anymore? I, I learned two things in 40 years in the Foreign Service, and I will now impart to you both of those things free for nothing. Uh, I learned that you've got to be careful about what you get into. Sounds pretty basic. Um, I didn't learn that in Iraq. I learned that years before in Lebanon when uh, Israel was planning Operation Peace for Galilee to uh, remove the PLO and its uh, ancillary organizations out of range of uh, Israeli populations in northern Israel. Uh, it had been pretty rugged out there. I mean, uh, the, some of these organizations stopped at nothing uh, where there would be premeditated attacks, in one case, on an Israeli kindergarten. Uh, so hard to argue that getting rid of that particular threat was a bad idea. What neither Israel nor we did was think about the consequences. Uh, what were the consequences? Well, nine months after Peace for Galilee, the American embassy in Beirut blew up. I was in it. Uh, that was an operation beyond the wildest fancies of the PLO. Uh, six months later, it got worse. Marine Barracks, Beirut, October 23rd, 1983, 244 dead Marines. Uh, because we didn't have an intelligence failure, we had a failure of imagination, of being unable to imagine how a constellation of the Syrian regime, the new Islamic Republic of Iran, uh, the forerunner to Hezbollah, supported by both governments, what they could do. And suddenly the PLO, it looked like the good old days. Uh, a failure, again, of imagination. We, um, we got out in 1984. The Israelis hung in for 16 more years until 2000, and they got out. Uh, all the legacy of Operation Peace for Galilee, which seemed like such a good idea at the time, except it wasn't. Uh, 
careful getting in. Other lesson, see all Bruce, be careful getting out. Uh, once you're in, you're in. Boy, you can't rewind that film. Uh, and if your intervention is to take down somebody else's government, um, you're in in a very big way. And again, it's not that you should have planned for all the contingencies, it's that you cannot plan for all the contingencies because you're gonna see 30th order consequences. Not a person alive who could predict, have predicted in 2003 what Iraq would look like today. Uh, so how much of the burden of the unknown are you prepared to take on your shoulders to <coughs> excuse me, achieve the goal you, you wish or avert the danger you fear? Um, Iraq does make a good case study because we were not careful getting in and we were not careful getting out. Um, the other thing is, um, boy, it, this is not a three-act play. This is a 21-act play. Um, and it's just going to keep on going and going and going. Um, it's a problem for us as, as a people. We don't do patience well. Uh, that, <coughs> that is not how we built the country. Uh, we don't do history well. We don't do patience well. We also don't do language well. Uh, our approach generally uh, with people who are not fluent in English is keep saying it slower and louder, and eventually they'll get the message. Um, this does put us at a disadvantage in um, our international uh, conduct of international relations. I say this about the Foreign Service. All of us are professionally fluent in at least one language. You, you have to be. Um, so uh, careful in, careful out. The record of US leadership, spotty, to be certain. Uh, but overall, it, it kept the world from major cataclysm for more than seven decades. So I, I would invite us all uh, to, to look at the alternatives to that kind of leadership. Uh, we are seeing Europe at its greatest point of division since World War II right now. Uh, and you know, a, a subset of that international leadership has been leadership in Europe. Uh, we were early supporters of the steel and coal community in the 50s. Uh, why? Because it would keep Europe together and move the continent as a whole, the, the free part of Europe, in the right directions. We were early backers of the European Union for the same reason. Staunch supporters of NATO, not just as a, uh, a mechanism against further Soviet expansion, but because it kept Europe united and moving positively uh, as they developed internally. Um, so if, if we think that era has now come to an end, we, we owe it to ourselves, we owe it to our children. What era exactly do we have in mind for the future if we're not going to lead it? Um, so that was fun. Um, uh, you let me try to conclude on a, a more upbeat note as, well actually let me do one other thing to set the stage for you because it also gets at conventional wisdom which may be conventional but is seldom wise. As we look at the Middle East today, try to build a construct conceptually to understand it, uh, you, you pretty much need to start with the Middle East Cold War rather than the hot conflicts that move around it. Um, so who are the principal protagonists in the Middle East Cold War? Cold War? Uh, they would be Iran and Saudi Arabia. Uh, they're watching each other like hawks. One moves, the other tries to counter, and so forth. Uh, the uh, Iranians are doing this a bit more adeptly than the Saudis, but that's the architecture. The, the wisdom we think we have is, well, it's always been that way. You know, the Sunni, bas Sunni Islam bastion of Saudi Arabia against the Shia Islamic fortress of Iran. They have always been at each other's throats, uh, these two branches of Islam. They always will be. That's just the way it is, except it isn't. Um, the Nixon Doctrine, again, which was posited on not having another big American ground war in Asia anytime soon, to, to find allies in different regions that, that could keep the peace with our assistance, but without us having to be directly involved. That reached fruition in just one area, the Middle East. And who were the twin pillars of Middle East security? Iran and Saudi Arabia. Uh, under the Shah, um, 
at one point in the early 70s, the Sultan of Oman requested military support from Iran to put down a communist-backed rebellion in his country's west. Iranians deployed a mechanized infantry brigade, basically, and it worked. They, they restored stability to Oman. Did the Saudis go to battle stations over an Iranian armed presence in their peninsula? No, they facilitated the deployment. Uh, this was a time, incidentally, when uh, Israel had a virtual embassy in Tehran. I had my first tour in Iran, I, I saw it. I mean, uh, Uri Labrani, one of, one of the great strategic thinkers of Israel, was their de facto ambassador. So the immutability of uh, religion and other phenomena, not quite so immutable. Uh, you need to take it with a grain of salt. Uh, there has always been tension between the primary schools of uh, Islamic theology, but rather seldom has it led to violence. Uh, you need to take that step back and that longer look. Uh, the other point I'd make, same vein, uh, I, I talked about the PLO and associated groups. Um, my predecessor, not immediate, uh, in Lebanon who was killed was killed by the uh, Popular Front for the Liberation of Palestine. Uh, was that a radical Islamic organization? Not quite. Uh, their ideology was communism. Um, but surely their leader was a closet Islamist. Um, actually, he was a Palestinian Christian. Um, as the same thing with the Democratic Front for the Liberation of Palestine, also led by a Palestinian Christian, um, uh, equally nasty, but not as competent. Uh, so again, is Islam naturally inclined toward terrorism as a weapon of choice? Uh, not quite. You gotta look at the use of terror, and I think from a much different lens. Uh, it is a tactic, it is a weapon, it is not an ideology. Uh, just knowing these things helps you get a little bit of a stable footing as you look at the, the whole area. This really is the last point. I will try to lift you up as, uh, as dismal as all of this sounds today. As we face another cataclysm in Syria, interest, uh, uh, watch that space, the regime and its backers are now going to go after the last rebel stronghold of Idlib. Uh, that could, uh, it's gonna be kind of tough for the three million people who are cornered up there. Nonetheless, cherish the moment, savor the day, because three months you're gonna look back at today with real nostalgia, because three months from now, as bad as it is today, it's gonna be way worse. So, that's the best I can do at optimism, ladies and gentlemen. Now, Thank you, Ambassador. Uh, I'm Mike Hawley. I'm on the board of the World Affairs Council, and we're going to queue up for questions in just a second. But let me do one thing before we do that, and that is recognize our four named sponsors for this event today. And if I could get you to stand and stay standing, as we say in another organization, uh, we'll give you a big round of applause. So, uh, Anderson, Leneve, Peter Wright, I know you're here. There he is. Uh, stay standing. Uh, Bank of America, Arena Arline. Full Scale Productions, Glenn Fishkin. Providence Day School, Lauren Fauchier. Let's give these folks a round of applause. So I'm not sure, do we have microphones out there or are people just going to have to uh, uh, talk loudly with your questions? You got one? Okay, beautiful. Uh, so uh, if you could uh, get the attention of the microphone holder back there, uh, we'll get you queued up. Uh, Mr. Ambassador, um, quick question for you. You were gracious to invite Lubomir Stambuk, the uh, CEO of the World Affairs Council, uh, on a mission trip to Afghanistan. Uh, we were all terrified by that. Uh, what, can you tell us a little bit about what it's like to take civilians uh, into a war zone? And most importantly, did he behave himself there? Did he, did he wander uh, out of the compound at night or anything like that? I could tell you stories. <laughs> um, yes, we had a, what I thought was a very important World Affairs Council mission to Afghanistan that uh, LJ was part of. Uh, 
I'd done this one other time, uh, invited the World Affairs Council to send a mission to Iraq uh, during the time between the election of President Obama and his entry into office in, in January. Uh, uh, I just thought it would be really great for the new administration to get a perspective on Iraq uh, from a group of uh, non-officials who care deeply about international affairs. Uh, and the World Affairs Council is natural. I mean, you, you are a non-partisan group. Um, uh, you are well known for not following the dictates of any administration. Uh, rebellion comes to mind. Uh, uh, so it, it, uh, I thought it was uh, very successful in both countries. Uh, the success in Iraq led me to put forward the notion of uh, an Afghanistan mission. Uh, is it uh, dangerous in Afghanistan? Well, yeah, you know, there's a war on. Uh, there was a war on in Iraq. Does that mean you stay the hell away from it? Absolutely not. Look, uh, if the councils exist, to help educate Americans on why the international arena is important, it's kind of a little like the Foreign Service. I mean, you've got to go into some crunchy places. Uh, obviously, I was not going to do anything ridiculously stupid, uh, putting them in, uh, in harm's way unnecessarily, but it's a war. Things happen. Uh, I'm very pleased that LJ and his colleagues were prepared to accept that risk uh, and bring that pr fresh perspective. You know, why are the, we there? Uh, what matters, what doesn't, what's the perspective. You've got to be ready to do that. And again, the World Affairs Councils and uh, LJ in particular were prepared to step up to that. Just wait for the next one I got in mind for you. How does, <laughs> how does South Sudan sound? <laughs> <laughs> we're going to have to run that by Natasha. Lauren, you have a questioner? Hi, Mr. Ambassador. My name is Edie Garwood. I have two questions, I'm sorry, but I whittled it down from a dozen. Uh, the first question I have is the United States is always known for supporting, uh, to different levels, international human rights and humanitarian law ever since World War II. This administration seems to be attacking those values and principles, especially in our foreign relations. Now, I hear you speak about voices of stability, and you name specifically Saudi Arabia, Egypt, Jordan, and Israel, all human rights violators, and even have committed war crimes. Are you on the same page as President Trump and feel that that is not sacrificing our values? That, that's, that's probably good enough for starters, I think, don't you think? Mr. Ambassador, do you want to address that first? And, and the second and we'll, question yeah. has to do with consequences. Trump has changed the policy, the U.S. policy, concerning Israel and Palestine in major ways by moving our embassy, recognizing Jerusalem as the unifi uh, unified capital of Israel, and now cutting aid to UNRWA, the main human humanitarian agency for the Palestinians. So consequences, how are we going to be, or what do you imagine we're gonna see in the next decade because of those actions that aren't easily reversible. And thank you so much for entertaining those two questions. Uh, well, thank you, they're good questions and you're gonna have to decide whether you're gonna permit more than one question per person. But, yeah, uh, we will, uh, just one. Uh, look, I, I, uh, I, I kinda wish that uh, President Trump and I were on the same page because that would mean he had an actual policy uh, in the Middle East. Uh, you know, I made the point that we don't have that luxurious choice between autocracies and democracies out there, um, and that some of our traditional allies do some pretty bad things at home and regionally. I got it, I mean, I, I know that. Uh, my point was, you gotta work with who you can work with. Uh, it is not gonna get any better out there if we decide that because we see human rights violations at home and in the region caused by these governments, we're not gonna have anything to do with them. Where exactly do you think that's gonna take us? Uh, if we wanna see change, the only way I can see us getting it is to shore up those relations to the point where you can have a dialogue that may actually lead to positive change. You're not gonna get it by pulling back and delivering lectures. We kinda like to do that. Uh, get our stuff out of the way and then tell them what for, uh, uh, I gotta tell you, it does not work. Uh, 
The, the world is not black and it is not white, certainly my area in the Middle East. It's varying shades of gray. Uh, you can decide or choose not to be part of it, uh, but then, as I said earlier, you got to, to what end, with what consequences. Um, uh, what, that was the first. The second was, yeah, well, ju just, just that. Um, first, the movement of the Israel, of the embassy from Tel Aviv to Jerusalem, that was not a foreign policy or national security decision. Um, if it had been, there would have been a conversation between President Trump and Prime Minister Begin that would have been along the lines of, I'm going to do this because I want to shake things up. The status quo has not gotten us anywhere. So I want to shake things up, and I'm prepared to do this. But for me to do this, you are going to have to do that, whatever that was. That conversation never took place uh, because the decision, again, was in a purely U.S. domestic context, not in a regional context. Uh, how dangerous is it? Yeah, it's dangerous. There was no immediate reaction because the constellation of forces just were not right for it, uh, but that's a bomb out there that's ticking, and it, it's going to go off at some point, and it will not be to our benefit. Great. And uh, Lauren is going to make her way around, uh, so just spot her when uh, it's time. Yeah, one of our students. Hello, my name is Armando Chardier with Charlotte Country Day School. And I was wondering, while uh, being ambassador uh, to Iraq, if there was a pr particular uh, diplomatic situation that you were in that defined uh, Iraqi-U.S. relations while you were um, a diplomat uh, for the U.S. in Iraq. Yeah, that's a great question. And let me buy some time for myself as I try to think of a coherent uh, answer uh, by saying how pleased I am to see uh, so many schools and so many students uh, here uh, at this luncheon, it's become clear to me over the years that first engaging young Americans in our policy process, in our international engagement, is really, really important. The second thing that has become clear to me is you can't start that at the college level. Um, it, it's already too late. If, if uh, incoming freshmen are not already kind of aware of and interested in the, uh, the outside world, there's just too much new coming at you in college for you to take on uh, uh, a whole new area. So the, the fact that this council is so engaged uh, with Charlotte schools and students and that you are here uh, gives me some hope that uh, you will go forth and uh, clean up the massive messes that my generation has made of the world. Uh, a, a particular instance, um, it defined things for a while, nothing lasts forever. Uh, there was a moment in September of 2007. Uh, I had been hammering away on the Prime Minister on the need for outreach to the Sunni Arab population in Iraq's west that uh, felt they were um, in grave danger from a Shia-led administration. They had been through some awful conflicts the year before. Uh, and we persuaded him to do a, uh, a budget supplemental of $250 million, the first one in post-2003 Iraq. So yeah, I, look, this is the financial capital of America. I, I won't repeat that. I'll be speaking in New York City tomorrow. But, um, uh, so you would get this. Uh, we, we did a lot of dumb things in Iraq, teaching them the budget supplemental process may over the long run be the worst. Uh, but they did it, and Maliki authorized $250 million. Uh, I went out to Ramadi, and with me were the Shia vice president and the Kurdish deputy prime minister. We rolled this out uh, as a joint U.S.-Iraqi government initiative to a hall crowded with celebrating tribal leaders uh, many of them not completely disarmed. Uh, the Shia vice president, who had never been in Ramadi and hadn't been looking forward to this trip, gave me one of those looks across the room that said so eloquently, I'm going to die here today, and it's your fault. Uh, uh, but he, he didn't. And for that brief shining moment, which actually lasted a couple of years, uh, we had managed to get a conversation going, backed by cash, 
uh, between the Shia and the Sunni communities. And it would not have happened if we had not been right in the middle of it. Uh, that's the kind of thing you've got to be prepared to do. Uh, parties may not agree with each other on anything, may be unable to make any kind of concession because of their experience. If we're in the middle, we can put those things together. Again, that's what diplomats do, and sometimes it can even be kind of fun. <laughs> Lauren, I think there's a question over here, and then Lauren will head over to this side of the room. Mr. Ambassador, thank you for coming to Charlotte. Although Turkey is not part of the Middle East, what happens there ripples through the region and has a tremendous impact. And both during the past administration as well as the present, we've seen a lot of friction between us and Turkey. What's coming down the road? What should we be doing? How should we be engaging in there? And how do we advance our, our interest given all these problems? Yeah, that, that's a great question. And of course, we talked about that a bit last night. Uh, so Turkey has been uh, an essential part of our national security calculus, not just since World War II, but during World War II. Uh, there was a, a lot of competition uh, between the, uh, the contending sides in that war. The Germans were trying to bring them into the Axis uh, we were trying to bring them into the Allied camp. The Turks wisely stayed out of it. Uh, it took some real leadership on their part, and they, they were up to it. Uh, the Turks were essential during the Cold War as a bulwark against communism. They're essential today as the hinge point between Europe and the Middle East. Uh, it, in terms of those imperfect uh, political societies, Turkey would be an example. Um, they are a democracy, uh, yet every 10 years, more or less, every 10 years exactly, starting in 1960, in 1960, the Turkish military would carry out a coup against the civilian government, stabilize things, uh, get rid of the people it wanted to get rid of, and then hand it back to the civilians. They did it in 60, 70, 80, and 90. I was there in 70 and 80. Um, it was a given then that that's the role of the army in Turkey. In the Ataturk model, they would be the guarantors of democracy, even if it meant a military coup, uh, because they always then handed power back over. I still don't know how Erdogan managed to break the power of the Turkish army. I, I, I still haven't got that. Uh, uh, it was deemed to be impossible, but he did it. Uh, we should be standing up and cheering, shouldn't we? Well, all of a sudden, the Turkish army and coups are looking better and better. Um, they, God knows they tried, that was, not, that was not the Turkish army leadership. When the Turkish army leadership gets behind it, it works. Uh, this didn't, it was kind of a company grade affair. Uh, where is Erdogan gonna take the country? I don't know, I'm not sure he knows. Uh, uh, it is part of that shift to autocratism. Uh, uh, we'll see. Uh, here I think Europe pays pays a price. The, the message from Europe for years has been, uh, you Turks are good enough to fight and die for us as a founding member of NATO, but you're never gonna be good enough to join the Gentlemen's Club of the European Union. Uh, Turks are a proud f people with a proud heritage. I think they had heard about all of that that they could stand, particularly out in Anatolia, where the traditional Turkish establishment never ventured. Uh, uh, Erdogan has massive support at the village level uh, throughout the, the Asian mainland. Uh, mm -hmm. Will that last? You know, who knows? But I can tell you that, again, you would all get this, given Charlotte's unique position in the, the country and the world. Watch the economy. Uh, Erdogan was substantially helped by a major economic boom in his early years. That boom is no longer, and we're gonna see if it goes into a bust. Uh, I think that will determine his longevity and what kind of structures he will ultimately leave behind him. It is the economy. Stupid. <laughs> Not you. <laughs> we have time for two more quick questions. Lauren, if you'll locate to those. Hello, thank you so much for coming to Charlotte today. Um, I have one question and then one really brief question at the end, just to lighten things up How a about bit. just one? <laughs> um, 
So as you know, many nations are pursuing more isolationist policies. The Trump administration has prided itself on America first. Britain's Brexit movement has isolated itself from the European Union. Hungary has built a border wall to pre prevent refugees from flooding in. What repercussions will this have on relations between nations and relations between peoples of different nations? And what's your favorite color? <laughs> <clears throat> the, um, it is the question, ultimately. Uh, we're we're kind of getting a sneak preview of what the absence of leadership, of US leadership may look like, uh, certainly in Europe. Uh, you know, again, the, the Brexit vote, strongly supported by President Trump, ran directly counter to the policy, policies of U.S. administration since Truman, as I mentioned. Uh, we have always had, as a central plank, European unity, uh, uh, both for positive and for some of the negative reasons I, I tried to sketch out. Uh, so, um, uh, we are seeing in Europe, we're seeing in our own country, let's, let's, let's be frank about it, uh, uh, a sense that the post-war order is no longer making life better for a lot of people. Uh, for folks like me, um, America's been a great place because the post-war order favored me. Got a great job, uh, made sufficient money, you don't get rich in the foreign service, but uh, never had to worry about money. It was, life was good. Well, for half the nation, as we saw, life wasn't so good. Uh, we're seeing the same thing now, I, I think, elsewhere. Uh, uh, where does it go? Well, I, again, um, I, I worry greatly about a disunified Europe, given Europe's past. Uh, and the, the frictions now between states, the weakening of the European Union, frankly, the weakening of NATO, um, uh, all worry me greatly. Not because of the Russian threat. Uh, you know, I'm fine with Putin doing whatever he wants to do in Syria, not on a humanitarian level, uh, but I can see Putin doing basically what his, Soviet's predecessor, his Soviet predecessors did. He's gonna bankrupt the country. Uh, uh, it's, their economy is already in shambles, uh, and uh, as we know so painfully and so well, uh, wars cost money. So I'm, you know, have at it. Uh, yeah, you're gonna pay for it literally in the long run. Uh, it, so it's not that, it, it's this leaderless, growing global disunity uh, that, that I really fear, uh, in Europe and in the Middle East especially. Asia, Africa are different stories, which mercifully we don't have time for because I don't know much about them. But, but we're in a period of political global entropy. Uh, the center is not holding. We are the center. What's next? I think we're gonna have to close on the question, what is your favorite color? Red, white, and blue. There you have it. <laughs>